All right, check this out. The best tool, generally speaking, for resistance training or strength training is free weights. Generally speaking, again, it's better than machines, it's better than bands, better than cables, better than body weight. All right, guys, let's talk about this. How's that comedian say it? Here's your sign. Here's your sign. Remember that one? The yeah, blue blue collar comedy guys. Oh, I yeah. don't know that. That's, yeah, you don't know that one. No, I yeah, know that's that. when you like when you say something like obvious. It's like, super I think obvious. That's, I think that's pretty obvious. It's you know it's not. It's controversial. It's really it's, in our space. I've I've seen people debate this before. Which I think we should talk want? about why we are these say, machine people. Are yeah, typically. Yeah. yeah, cable machine people. And it, by the way, I said generally because definitely there are situations and cases where um, machines and cables are superior, but. Overall, when you're looking at, and when you have to consider the overall, right, the whole picture, function, performance, strength, muscle building. Versatility. Versatility. Uh, free weights are just, they're, they're remarkably effective. And even, and even when you compare them towards machines that are almost identical in terms of the movement pattern, like a hack squat is similar to a barbell squat. But a barbell squat is just uh, so much more effective at all those other things that I well. And do you listed. think that is mainly because of just the instability that it causes? Because when you're doing dumbbells or free barbell, like you have to balance the weight versus something being on a track. Yeah, you know, I would say so. But you know what the problem with that is? Is that you know when I was training people in the early 2000s, or well, you guys were too, the instability you know, uh, crowd went crazy, right? It was like mm -hmm. standing on wobble discs and physio Lucy balls, balls. and dyna discs. And so there's definitely a, a diminishing returns with that kind of stuff. Um, and we haven't really been able to identify specifically why this anecdote is so common. Like if you talk to top coaches, trainers, if you, if you like just took a, a survey of a hundred of really, really good coaches and trainers, a majority of them would, would agree. Now, some of them would disagree, but a majority of them would, would agree. Studies can show that there's evidence to kind of support what we're talking about. Like a barbell squat tends to translate more on the field than like a leg press, for example. Um, muscle building, I don't know if there's really any studies that show what we're talking about, but there's a lot of anecdote and it's hard to explain why. My theory is that obviously our bodies evolved in the real world, in nature, and so our bodies evolved lifting free things. You yeah. know, so I think it mimics, or, or at least it, it it sets in motion adaptation processes that evolved lifting things that were more cl similar to free weights than to machines and cables. So my theory is that it's it's a lot more difficult. So the the learning curve is longer. So the the gains and or potential gains that you could get from it just are extended. So I I think if we were to graph this, and let's say you had like a free motion machine or let's just or your whatever your hammer strength favorite machine for like chest right and then you had like a dumbbell press i think at the beginning they would look pretty close mm -hmm. and then i think that you would get adapted to the machine relatively quicker and then you would see kind of this plateau where the free weights would kind of continue because there's, there's less ranges of motion to consider in terms of having to stabilize and control right and so i i honestly look at it as a if we're looking at like a signal perspective of how many muscles we need to incorporate for different tasks in each movement, each exercise. So in terms of like me doing, say, uh, an overhead press on a track, like I can I can extend and press uh, this weight overhead, but at the same time, it's not putting as much demand laterally, uh, rotationally, uh, and also uh, stabilizing completely on the way down as well, which is the eccentric portion. I think there's more demand too with the free weights with gravitational force. Yeah. I'm, so, okay. So I'm going to get to that because I, I love what you said and I, I got some thoughts around that, but here's something that a lot of people don't realize that's obvious. I remember learning this when I went to go buy and open my own gym and I, you talk to machine manufacturers and, you know, hammer strength and all that stuff and Nautilus and all these, you know, Cybex. Most machines are designed around some a male who's about 5'10", 5'9", 5'10". Then they have adjustable seats and arms to kind of accommodate people outside of that. But what happens when you work out with a machine is that you have to follow the machine's path and track and range of motion, essentially. Free weights follow your body. So if I'm doing an overhead press with someone who's, with a kid who's, you know, 4'10", or a, a man that's you know six foot eight, the free weights will follow them. They're not following the machine. And how many times have you guys had a client that was 
outside of the average, you go in a machine and it just doesn't work very well for their body, right? So there's that. And then what you said, Justin, mm -hmm. here's what's interesting about the central nervous system, because that's what, right, that's what sends the signal for the muscles to work, right? We've used the amplifier versus the recruitment speaker. process. Yeah. When you activate the central nervous system, uh, when you activate more of it, then it, it fires harder and more effectively in specific ways. So for example, if I want to press one dumbbell overhead, but maintain a relaxed body, I'm only going to be able to press so much weight. If I tense up my entire body, mm -hmm. I can use, typically I can lift 10% or more. Powerlifters know this. When powerlifters bench press, they talk about using leg drive. Like what the hell do legs have to do with the bench press? You're just putting your legs on the ground, they're not lifting the bar. But they noticed a long time ago that when they activate their lower body, they could press more weight. And free weights tends to encourage that because yeah. of that. Pro like if I'm doing a standing overhead press, I have to tense my whole body right. just to support myself and balance. And so I'm able to probably fire more muscle fibers as a result. Like you could probably intensify your machine workouts by intentionally bracing really hard and trying to add more, um, you know, muscle tension to contribute. However, yeah, free weights are just more, they, they just place that demand naturally uh, on your body in order to be able to even maintain the certain posture and control of your body. Yeah. And I, th again, I, th I say generally, because I know there's going to be cases where someone's like, Oh, I got better results using a machine, um, or, you know, this leg exercise. But when well, I an train example of when that would happen is when someone's, uh, when someone's form and technique is so bad on an exercise, then having a machine where you, it helps you with that could accelerate their their and you their can results. push harder for example. right right so there there are cases where that will make sense but I, I again i go i go back to i think where the real benefits kick in it's the learning curve i think it's that if you were to look head to head with the, the point you guys are making with the machine and free weights i think it would be like a little bit better at first like if you zero zero no one you've never done anything you're just starting someone they're brand new yeah and they one's doing machine exercise the other one's doing free weight yeah, exercise. let's compare a hack squat to a barbell squat for right example. right so and i think at initially the the, the gains and results uh would be pretty close i still think free weights would be a little bit better but it would be pretty close I think it's where it really kicks in is over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cause because if you, put a, if you put a new client on a, a hack squat machine in a relatively short period of time in comparison to the barbell squat, they'll be able to push with maximal force. Yeah. With a barbell squat, they it's going to take a while. It's going to take a year, two years. Yeah. They could be doing that movement for years before they can even really, truly max, maximize it because it it's so challenging. Yeah, difficult. that doesn't mean you're not getting results the whole time. Right. But yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean- of all the people that I trained, um, I never saw, uh, well, I don't want to say never. Of course, there's always exceptions. But g again, generally speaking, nothing came close. And yeah. I didn't care what exercise it was. You know, Even if it was a cable curl versus a dumbbell curl, as silly as it sounds, very simple, basic exercise. Yeah, by the way, this I had a, as a kid, this is my own anecdote. I was, uh, I had a dislocated my knee as a kid. And long story short, I finally decided I'm just going to go work out so I can rehab it and and then I, I was training my legs really hard. I was doing the leg press, the hack squat, the leg extension, leg curl. I was doing different uh, varieties of leg presses and hack squats in the Smith machine. And I developed, my legs built. They definitely built. And I was pushing weight and I was pretty strong. Right? I was a 16-year-old kid, pretty strong. Then I met those power lifters and they're like, dude, just barbell squat. And I swear to God, I barbell squatted and I gained 10 pounds that summer. And I'd never seen my lower body respond the way it did with all those other exercises. That was my own personal yeah. experience. Well, it was interesting because I, I remember talking to one of my clients who was always focused on Smith machine bench press and uh, just uh, was like discussing like, what's the difference? Why? Because they, they tried like a regular barbell a bench press and could only do half the weight. Mm. And they were just like mystified by that. And I was a new trainer and I had a hard time kind of describing all that, but like just all those little nuanced variables of, you know, the ability for the barbell to kind of travel for, away from you, behind you, tilt, you know, all these types of, you know, things that don't seem like a lot, but when you add weight to it and you keep stacking that, that's a lot more for your body to account yeah. for. By now, the way, if, if you ever see me and I rarely ever work out in commercial gyms, Usually it's a hotel gym if I'm traveling. I will use lots of machines and cables, mainly because I never do. So I work out, I'd say probably 90% of my workouts revolve around free weights. So the novelty effect is great 
with machines and cables. So if you see me in a commercial jam, what you'll probably see me doing are a lot of things that I don't normally do, and there's value there. There's also value in certain cases of rehab. There's certain exercises that just don't work well with free weights. Like if I'm doing a cable chop, obviously I can't, gravity doesn't work sideways, you know, tricep press down. There's certain exercises that are uh, more suited for, you know, cables and machines. Cables, by the way, are my favorite machine. They're the most versatile form of machine. What I said earlier about free weights mirroring the body and, and or the body having to calm, you know, uh, follow the track of the machine. Yeah, it moves with you. Really At well. least with cables, right? Uh, you can really adjust that for the individual. I mean, when I had my wellness studio, I had a I had a, a cage, so I had a squat rack, I had dumbbells, um, I had bands, and I had cables, and that was it. I didn't have a single machine in there, and I trained everybody that way, and it was great. And I worked out that way. That's all, and it's still to this day. Again, if you see me working out, that's pretty much what I'll what I'll be using. Now there are some studies that actually counter the point that we're trying to make right now um and i you know people tend to jump on them especially if you're a big machine or cable person and that's the uh you know the, the short periods where they 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 track people for like six weeks and they're talking about muscle activation yeah, yeah. so you'll make this case sometimes that oh well hack squat fires the quads way more than okay. the and, muscles are more active uh, right yeah with the, the, the entire time they're more right tense. and so they'll they'll take that on this this yeah. and they'll study the two groups and compare and compare them and make the case that hey if you want to develop your quads um this machine is actually superior and so that's why i think there is a lot of debate around this conversation even though i think initially we teased you in saying that this is obvious but you're right. There's some contention around it or some debate. I think that's one of the reasons why there's debate is because you see these muscle activation studies that show that these muscles are firing way more on this machine, but that doesn't tell the whole story. No, right? I, the, the, there's a huge limitation with studies on this. Like a real world, like our experience is based off of training people for long periods of time. So like you'll talk, you'll hear us talk about the value of, you know, 15 to 20 rep range or the value of one to five rep range. Well, when they do studies on rep ranges for eight weeks, you know, eight to 10 or eight to 12 builds more muscle than both of those rep ranges. However, what they don't consider in their short period, their short studies is over time, your body tends to get used to a particular rep range and switching will get your body to move again. And all of them build muscle. So although one might be a little better in the short term, all of them still build muscle. They all have value. And so I'm talking about I, you know, I trained people for years. I know you guys did too. And so that's what this is based off. This is not like I trained 15 people for three months and I found in three months that machines were as effective as free weights. It's like, no, I trained people for, I had clients over me for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And when you start training people for long, you know, extended period of times, or you work out yourself for long extended periods of time, that's when these things start to reveal themselves and you start to see, oh, I can see now the value in this way of training, because although this one was great for the first six months, I started to develop some joint pain or I started to lose mobility or really stopped working after a short period of time. Whereas this other method, you know, gave me these long-term, you know, benefits. And then the, we can't dismiss the functional aspect, right? Um, how well does the strength that you build in the gym translate into the real world. Yeah. We need that's very I think a lot of people are who are just interested in in changing how they look dismiss that, but I'm going to tell you right now, if your function is good, the odds that you'll look good for longer periods of time are higher. Mm -hmm. So you can't dismiss that. Now you don't have to become the super functional athlete, but don't dismiss the functional aspect because losing function will eventually take away from the aesthetics that you're trying to build. It'll, it'll definitely take away from your physique. And I look, I tell you what, fine. You can see this sometimes in gyms, these old, you know, ex bodybuilders that really never learned how to train that way. And you can tell like, they're so limited with their exercises. Oh, I used to squat. I used to, and then I hurt, and I can't do anymore because it hurts my back. And they're very limited. And you can tell that their, their bodies start to suffer as a result of it. So, you know, keep that in mind. That includes mobility, right? Keep mm -hmm. that in mind because if that goes down, then your you know repertoire of effective exercises becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And what you could do to get your body to, to feel good and look good becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And then your appearance and your aesthetics start to suffer as a result. This application of you know advice and training is so important. Um, and the, by the way, this is one of the reasons why one of the only certifications we work with is NCI. 
it's not because they they communicate the best nutrition information. They but do the, have great nutrition talk information. Talk all about the application. It's about the application. Yeah. I've seen other courses, and they're really great for education. So they're going to make you really smart. But if you can't apply it, it means nothing as a trainer. I don't care how much you know. If you yeah. can't coach someone or train someone, it's not uh, going to get them closer to their re desired results. It's not going to help. And that's the entire point of why they're there. I think we lose sight of that all the time. Yeah. Well, how, how often do you guys read comments on like YouTube and our reviews and stuff like that of people that say that they've learned more from the show than they have from any of their certification they have because we speak more to the application of the science than we actually talk about the science itself yep. because you have to factor in behavioral stuff. If you're yep. not pay factoring that in, you're crazy because it's one of the biggest pieces to their success. It's if not mm -hmm. the biggest piece. Yeah. And, and you know, and ironically, certifications leave that out. They do. They don't teach. Here's two things that certifications leave out that NCI tackled, which is why I think they're growing so fast. They leave out a pl application. Like I've done certifications. I know you guys have too. They rarely ever talk about, like they'll tell you here's the science, but then they won't tell you, but here's what actually happens and here's right. how it affects your clients. And, and here's, here's an example of a client that has all these conditions and here's how I would appropriately kind of take them through and, and get them, you know, on a better path. Yeah, they don't they do not do that. They just no, they leave that just, out. Here's the science and then figure it out. Yeah, and then they also leave out the, here's how you become a successful trainer. Nobody teaches you that. Like you yeah. go get certified. None of them teach you, because here's the deal. If you're a not successful trainer, if you don't know how to build your clientele, you don't know how to organize it, manage it, you don't know how to charge the right rates, you don't know how to, you're going to fail, you're not going to succeed, then you can't train people, you can't help anybody. And certification courses spend zero time on this. There's yeah. no time spent on this at all. Which is crazy because uh, aren't these certifications trying to prepare you to be successful and actually make a career out of this long term? Yep. And you have to be able to make money. Oh, I tell you what, look, we all manage trainers. Uh, what, how, what percentage of your time was spent teaching your trainers biomechanics and science and what percentage of your time was spent teaching trainers application and how to build their business. Yeah. 80, 20. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was mostly application and how to build your business. Yeah. Hey, if you enjoyed that clip, you can find the full episode here or you can find other clips over here and be sure to subscribe.